Hello, welcome to the Freedom From Anger podcast. This is just a quick little intro before the intro. I just wanted to reach out to whoever's listening to this and my listeners and let them know that I'm doing fine. I've been a little bit slow on getting content out there, but I promise you I've got a definitely a busy April. Got a lot of good people on deck to interview, so we should be hitting May with a ton of content that's probably close to my one year mark of doing this. So 2024 has been a little hectic. So just trying to do the best I can, get the information out there that's going to be beneficial to y'all. And I'll be quiet and I'll let you listen in to the podcast. Thank you. Bye. Hello, welcome to the Freedom From Anger podcast. I'm joined today with James Christensen. He is a Air Force retired veteran. He was a helicopter pilot, and he is now a combat marriage therapist in California. And he's here to share some of his wisdom that he's learned over the years, and hopefully provide some information to help all y'all out there. He's been married for 22 years. He's got four children, so he's obviously doing something right. Hey, James, how you doing? Thank you for having me. Nice to be here. Okay. So I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, okay, what's a combat marriage therapist? That's just, I, I enjoy the, the more high conflict uh, relationships. I, I specialize in couples because I find them more interesting. There's more information. It's more rich. You can't pretend to be someone you're not if your spouse is in the room with you. So, so I just find it to be more real because the the truth always comes out, at least in the body language, if not in the verbal language. Yeah, that's interesting. I was working with a client yesterday, and we discussed communication and body language quite a bit. And a lot of people don't understand that the majority of communication is through body language, tone, and actually the words we say is only a very small percentage. That comes up all the time with couples and often I'll have someone say, well, maybe, maybe my tone wasn't correct. The problem is that you can't actually, you know, you live with someone for say 20 years, that person knows everything you feel inside. And so, you know, if I'm feeling anger inside me or resentment, there's nothing I can do about my tone. That is my tone. The emotional content of my soul is my tone. And so people come to me all the time and say, well, I just need to learn to, I need to learn to communicate differently, or I need to learn to have a different tone. And I say, no, you need to learn to start loving because if you don't have love inside you, you know, you've been this, with this person for say 20 years or 10 years, they know, and there's absolutely nothing you can do to paper over that. It's just, we know what we're feeling inside. Our bodies resonate with each other and we sense it on a, on a somatic level. Oh yeah, definitely. It's interesting how. We think we're communicating, but we're not. I can't remember who said it, but there's a quote that says, the biggest miscommunication is thinking that communication happened. <laughs> so. There's there's an opposite view on that also, which says that, that you know, often couples, couples always talk about communication. Like when I ask them, well, well, can I help you with communication is always on the list. The problem is that usually in a relationship, we already know what is going to be said before it's been said because we know each other so well. And so the problem with communication is not so much that communication isn't happening. It's that we don't want to hear what is being communicated. And so, you know, the the message, you know, most relationships have a certain degree of tension in them. And that's a very uncomfortable message to hear. I don't want to hear that you're happy being my partner. And so I'm going to protest against the idea that you would express that. and, And this is where anger gets mixed up into it. Oh, yeah. It's the whole avoidance of pain. If I think you're going to say something I don't want to hear, then I'm just going to avoid it. And my partner knows that I'm avoiding it. Then that just kind of creates other issues down the road. I like to to work with clients on trying to untangle their adult relationships from kind of the remnants of their childhood relationships. So we all learn about family relationships or intimate relationships via growing up with parents. And so you know, my first taste of human relationship is I'm, I'm a little person. I have no power. I have, you know, a half developed brain. I have no emotional maturity and I'm in relationship with a person who's three times my size, has all the power in the relationship and sometimes, you know, gets intense, gets upset. 
sometimes neglects me, sometimes is overwhelming. And so I'm dealing with all of this from the position of a child where I can't do anything to change that relationship. I have very little power in the relationship. And so, you know, fast forward 20 years, now I'm in an adult relationship. I have lots of power in the relationship, but my body still reacts as if I was the powerless one, as if I had no choice but to say, listen to my partner, be cruel to me, if, if that's the kind of person they are. That I can't leave the room. I can't disengage. I can't say, please don't talk to me that way, right? So, so I have to keep participating in this difficult engagement as if I were a child and I didn't have the choice to, to take care of myself. Yeah, I've worked with domestic violence abusers or batterers, however you want to uh, put it, mm -hmm. for many years. And that's typically the road that I like to go down because when we're young, we're learning. So if I'm surrounded by toxic relationships, the chances of me having a toxic relationship and acting in that same fashion is pretty high. So if I'm around a lot of domestic violence growing up, like you said, you're young, you don't have any power, but the whole time you're learning. And then lo and behold, when I become an adult, guess what? I'm committing domestic violence and stuff because to me, that's normal because that, that's what I'm used to. And a lot of people don't really make that connection. It's like, okay, well, what kind of relationships did your parents have? That's our model. We really don't know any better. And so one of the great struggles in life is growing up more than your parents grew up or especially more than your parents grew up before you left home. So we kind of leave home, you know, having, having a model of the maximum level of maturity that our parents achieved, you know, when we left home and then everything else we have to figure out on our own. And some of us have parents who figure things out later in life, but that doesn't help us as much if they figure things out when we're say 10 years old. So it's, it's useful. I mean, I'm a parent and it's, I can even see the difference. My younger children benefited from having a better dad than my older children did. So they got, they got lucky that way because I grew up a little bit. Yeah. And that's a great thing. Everybody matures at different rates and everybody grows up at different rates. And no matter how old we get, we can still change. We can still become better people. I've always hated to see young people use their age as an excuse to act foolish when they know better. Well, and that's what we ask our children all the time, you know, yeah. don't yell in this house, right? Or something like that. So yeah. We do ask our children to be more mature than us frequently. When we're the ones with power in the relationship, they're the ones that don't have power. And yet we're the ones who parenting actually is very difficult and it pushes us to our limits and asks us to, to be more kind than we're actually capable of being. So it's pushing us to be a better person. But we often, it's easier for me to see, you know, my child's misbehavior than to see my own this When realistically, I should be holding myself to a much higher standard just because I'm older. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It is very challenging and definitely makes you grow up. You're right. And we want our children to do better than, than we did. And we're asking them to be more mature at the ages where we were not mature at all. And there's that just natural pushback and you just gotta do the best that you can and hope for the best. Cause once they're, they have become adults, it's their life and they're taking the control and hopefully they fly right, <laughs> so to speak. There's kind of two ways to look at it. You can look at it and say, oh, this small person who lives with me is defective in some way. So I used to work in an agency where I did a lot of work with children who so were in contract with the county. And so parents would bring their kids in who'd gotten expelled from school or something like that. And, and often the message was the parents come in and my child is so defective. My child is just, he's just a bad apple, right? And so the way I look at it is different that you, your child is is doing the best that your child can do in the present circumstances. So there's a developmental challenge, there's a family system challenge, you know, you know, there's a certain amount of anxiety in your family, there's a certain amount of, say, abusive behavior, a certain amount of neglect going on. And then there's all these cultural influences. And so your kid's trying to figure things out the best he can, and it's a developmental challenge. So how can we help your child grow to become more capable of making good choices in life, making choices that will benefit him and not harm him? But if you look at it from, oh, my child's broken, my child's defective, that actually contributes to the problem because you're looking down on your child, you're condescending to your child, you're criticizing your child instead of encouraging and building. And that doesn't mean, you know, doesn't mean you're going to coddle. You're still going to have standards, you're going to have boundaries, and you're going to have rules and expectations. In fact, I usually tell parents to have stricter expectations, but it's going to be done with love and encouragement, not with criticism and condescension. So it's very different energy to it. So much, it's like we've started with, it's not what you say, it's the energy you bring that matters. Because if you tell somebody they're bad or they're stupid or 
dumb or whatever. If you tell that to them enough, they're going to believe it <laughs> and they're going to just say, well, this is how I am. Like you said, you know, maybe I am defective or whatever, but a little bit of encouragement goes a long way because a lot of people don't get that encouragement. And when it's coming from a family member, it makes it even tougher. Yeah. I have to encourage parents to catch a child doing something, catch your child doing the smallest positive thing. So you know, if your kid brush your teeth before they go to bed, you, I mean, for a small child, just anything to say, Hey, and you don't even have to say, thank you so much for doing that. Or, or you did a good job, but you can just notice, Hey, I noticed you brush your teeth through really well tonight. And, and it's just, I, as a parent, am noticing you doing things that are beneficial for your, for your health and safety. And because most of the time, not most of the time, but there's a tendency as parents to notice child's misbehavior and not notice the child's positive behavior. And if we spend more time noticing misbehavior, the child perceives that relationship with the parent as being about misbehavior and not about positive. Shifting gears a little bit. So I always enjoy working with the veterans, first responders. Obviously you do as well. What do you think is the... The difference between working with a veteran versus civilian. It's worth, I mean, most, most veterans and most, well, at least most, you know, law enforcement of firefighters are, are, are men. And there's a really interesting selection bias that goes into why did I join the military? Why did I join the police? Why did I join the fire service? The first time when I set foot on the Air Force Academy deciding whether to attend or not, I felt this magnetic draw, like I had to go. And that's uh, a frequent, uh, I talk to other people who, who joined police or joined the fire service or joined the military, they're like, no, I had to go, like I had to join. And, and some of that is a longing for a, a masculine presence in your life. And so a lot of us have had fathers who weren't closely involved in us growing up. And, and so we, there's this, there's this masculine brotherhood that calls to us, says, come be part of us, come, come be, come be parented in a different way that maybe you didn't experience so much growing up. So that's part of it. As far as working with veterans, we're used to a sense, certain sense of control and propriety at work. So things are done a certain way. And sometimes there's a tendency to bring that home. That could also be the case of first responders, where when you have a job where, where life and death is on the line, you follow a procedure, you do things a certain way, and there's expectations of things happening in a certain order. Now, if you come home and you have young, young children in the house, that's not the way it works. And so children are chaos and, and you have to just dial down your expectations. Of like, okay, I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. They're not going to follow procedure. <laughs> They're not going to follow protocol. They're going to be chaos because that's what children are. And so you can set parameters for that and you can help guide them. But if I allow myself to get upset about that kind of normal childhood behavior, I'm going to make myself miserable. I'm going to make them miserable. Yeah, you definitely uh, hit the nail on the head there about lowering our expectations. If I didn't nickel every time I've said that, because I work a lot with first responders and military and just men in general that they always seem to find me. But yeah, but when you're coming from the military mentality, you know, it's A, B, C, D. It's not A, Z. We like structure. We like order. And then, hey, this is how you do things. This is the proper way to do things. And that's not, that's not the world. That's not reality. It's chaos. And then if we put our own expectations on everybody we come in contact with, whether it be our children or the person working at McDonald's, we're probably going to be right, upset mm -hmm. and probably going to be frustrated, but we just have to allow other people to be human because we're not perfect. And it is definitely things are not going to be always the way we yeah. want them to be. <laughs> Interesting question is how do you do that? How do you change? So let's say I had that tendency. I had the tendency to get upset about a certain person's behavior. That could be my, you know, my wife's behavior. It could be my kid's behavior. It could be someone else. So, so I end up in a situation in the world where I need you to be a certain way for me to be okay, which makes me live a very uncomfortable life because I'm constantly experiencing all this physical discomfort when other people don't behave the way I need them to behave. The way I work with clients around that is I want you to come into your body and figure out what you're feeling in your body because we turn this into stories in our mind. Well, you know, I'm upset because so-and-so did something. I mean, let's talk about what's actually really happening in the moment right now. What's happening in the moment right now is your body's experiencing the stress. You identify where in your body you're experiencing the stress. And it always lives along the center line, chest, stomach area. This is where we experience these. So what we call anger or anxiety or fear, resentment, frustration, these live along the center line of the body here. So you have a tightness in your chest. You have a pit in your stomach. You have a pain in the chest. You have a shortness of breath. Your heart's beating. All around, along the center of the body is where we experience these things. 
Now, if I can leave the story in my mind and come into the reality of the body, now I can actually start to do some work around taking care of my body because my body is responding to the situation as if it was a survival threat to me. That's why my body responds. It's a survival thing. Body's designed to survive. Body misinterprets situations. You know, you know, you and I as grown men, we face very few situations that actually threaten our survival. When we were little kids, it was much more risky to be a little kid. Kids aren't as safe as adults are. But our bodies still respond as if we were in a survival situation. And that means that I, as the adult, need to respond and take care of my body. Instead of trying to change the other person's behavior, I need to turn inside and take care of my own body and help myself feel better. Yeah, because that's the thing that we teach is it's not, when it comes to emotions, it's not strictly psychological. There is the physical aspects of it. And to really be in touch with your body, what's your body telling you? Because that's going to be the first thing that you notice. And then those primal fight, flight, or freeze instincts kick in. And your brain does not know the difference between, hey, I'm being attacked by a lion versus, hey, this person said something I don't like. And, it, and it's going to release the adrenaline, the cortisol, all those chemicals in, in our body. And... We ha we're trying to get to that, that okayness. What do I need to be okay in this moment? What can I do to be okay in this moment? And the tricky part about that is it's not what somebody else can do to get me back to okay. It's what can I do? Because a lot yeah. of us is, well, if they would shut their dang mouth, I'd be okay. Well, you ain't got no control over that, but mm. I have control over I do and that whole Responding versus reacting. Reacting's quick, it's dirty. It's not thought through. Responding, that's a, a totally different ball game. Yeah, I call it internal versus external referencing. And so as children, we were external referencers. So we turned to our parents and other people to, to let us know, am I safe? Am I okay? Am I good enough? What kind of a person should I be? What kind of path should I walk in life? That was all external. So our parents answered, answered those questions for us. Some coaches and teachers and our peers answered those questions for us. Am I good enough? Who should I be? Am I safe? Am I okay? Now, as adults, we face kind of a, a necessity to turn inward and start answering that question for ourselves. So I need to look inside and say, am I safe right now? And that needs to be answered by me, not by someone else. And so if, if I'm the kind of person, well, most of us are to a certain extent where, you know, if you're behaving a certain way, I don't feel safe. Even though realistically, you know, if I think of it, think through it with my kind of cognitive brain, oh, I'm totally safe right now. My emotions are telling me I'm not safe. My emotions are telling me there's a survival threat here when there isn't really. So I need to turn it inside and say, can I take care of my own body? Can I calm down my own body? I often tell people that you have two parts in your brain. You have, you know, your child brain, and then you have your adult brain. And so we started out in the world as, as very vulnerable, small beings, and, and the child brain reflects that. It says, you know, I live in this world. There's all these powerful people. I myself am not powerful. I need to maintain certain kinds of relationships with certain people in order to survive. That was all true. Now, as adults, uh, I am the powerful being in the world. I am the one who can care for myself. But my instinct is still to turn to someone else for that emotional support, that sense of being okay. And that can look like, I need you to stop talking that way. It can look like, I need you to not look at me that way. Or it can look like, you know, I need my partner to treat me a certain way for me to feel okay. But none of that is true. In the end, you know, I do have an adult brain. And when, I, when my child brain is feeling that need for someone to behave a certain way, I need to find that from, from my adult brain, from myself. I need to turn inside. For it. Yeah, that reminds me of, have you ever used the uh, Dr. Siegel, the hand model of the brain with the amygdala and the prefrontal mm -hmm. cortex? I've yeah, seen that. Yeah. And, I, and flipping your lid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's yeah, where you, you turn off the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, yeah. If you're upset or under the influence of alcohol and drugs, you flip your lid. So now you're operating all out of the primitive part of the brain, which is the fight, flight, freeze, and then the prefrontal cortex. Absolutely. That's the adult brain. Mm -hmm. And it, it, is, like. it is an actual blood, it's a blood flow thing. So there's a valve in the brain which shunts the blood towards the amygdala and towards the back of the brain mm -hmm. away from the prefrontal cortex. You ever find someone who's just been in, say, a car accident? You say, what's 105 divided by five? They'll be like, what are you talking about? If you say someone who's calm, say, what's 105 divided by five? They'll think for a second, they'll tell you the answer, right? But, but when we are in this fight, fight, freeze, prefrontal cortex doesn't have any, well, there, 
has limited blood flow to it because we don't need that. We need our survival brain. A lot of us are just walking around in the world with restrained blood flow to the prefrontal cortex most of the time, at least most of the time when we're in contact with other people. And so, you know, I'm sure you teach your clients breathing exercises where they say calm down. You calm your body first, allows your brain to function, and you make better decisions. Yeah. And a lot of people, when you talk about breathing exercises, they kind of roll their eyes or whatever. But I think it's amazing how breathing exercises have been around for thousands of years. And just here recently, we're starting to get a lot of scientific data to back it up. So there's a reason because it works. A lot of us, we don't properly yeah. breathe. <laughs> right. And I like to explain the science behind it, which is, you know, there's, well, you brought up the amygdala. I have a friend who calls the amygdala Amy. She calls mm. the polyvagal system poly. She's like, well, Polly mm. and Amy are acting up again, which I think is hilarious. But polyvagal nerve runs from the brain to your organs. And so your lungs is one of the things attached to the polyvagal nerve to the vagal nerve. And it sends this message up to the brain that says, hey, I'm breathing as if there were danger or I'm breathing as if there were no danger. So breathing as if there are no danger is, that's a relaxed breath, right? And just doing that right now, calm my body just once, took 10 seconds. And so I do that with clients in session because I want you to experience what it feels like. Let's take three deep breaths into the nose, out through the mouth. You're gonna breathe so deep that you have to tilt your head back to fill your lungs up. Then you're gonna breathe out through your mouth. And you're going to feel your body relax instantly. And just having felt that once, most of us don't even realize how much tension we're carrying around on a daily basis. Oh, definitely. I said that that vagus nerve that runs from your, your gut all the way up through your body into your brain. And then when you breathe, you activate that. And then that calms us down. Yeah, like deep breaths. I'm a big fan of box breathing because you really have to focus on that. You've got to count four, inhale, count four, exhale you know, so on and so forth. Bringing you into your body as opposed to living in this imagination land of thoughts, right? Because thoughts are just imagination. It's a dream. I call people and say, you know, have you ever had a stress dream where you're asleep and you're dreaming about some horribly stressful situation? Well, that's your body interpreting the stress it's feeling into some story that makes sense, right? And so my stress dream would always be being in college, late to class, and I look down, I have no pants on. I've had that dream a thousand times, right? Which is the mm -hmm. most ridiculous dream ever, but that's my stress dream. The thing is, when I wake up, I also have stress dreams where my body will feel some kind of tension. And then my mind will look around in the environment and say, oh, it's because of that person. It's a dream. It's just not true. The fact is my body is feeling uncomfortable because my body feels uncomfortable. And my responsibility is to take care of my body. Now, if I try to externalize that and say, oh, I'm going to take care of this person. Instead, you're just asking for a whole lot of trouble because that person's not going to want to change to accommodate your body's problems. But that's what we try to do. Yeah, and we also try to self-medicate and try to find ways to feel okay, whether it be alcohol or drugs, but it's not sustainable, it's dangerous, and it tends to lead to more problems, especially if you're married, because you tend to say and do things solution, we don't like. Part of the solution can be to to accept the fact that your body is just going to feel discomfort. Because we take these actions. So if I'm numbing, say with alcohol, it's because I'm feeling something in my body that I don't want to feel. So I feel this pain in my chest or the tightness in my chest that says my survival's in danger. So the solution is, can it be okay for me to feel what my body feels? So instead of making that feeling go away and I open myself up to that feeling, I agree to feel this feeling. So I brought, I was on vacation a couple of days ago and I brought home a McDonald's muck muff for the family for breakfast. And I didn't get the kind of milk muffin that my wife likes. And she had just woken up and she was a little grumpy and she kind of let me know that I got the wrong kind of McMuffin. And my body responded as if she stabbed me in the heart. Like, I don't know why this happened, but my body was like, no. And so, you know, in earlier years, I would have blamed that on her. I was like, well, if you could just be nice to me, blah, blah, blah. Because I've kind of learned what this is. I'm like, okay, my body's responding to a perceived survival threat about a McMuffin, right? Which is not real. And my body feels like it's real. And so I'm just going to take care of my body. And throughout that entire day, my body continued to kind of respond. I felt this tightness in my chest. I felt a pit in my stomach. I had to lay down and do some breathing exercises. And even then, it didn't go away. It was just there. And I was just like, you know what? For whatever reason, my body needs to feel the way it feels. And this really has nothing to do with McMuffins. And it has nothing to do with my wife. This is about me and my body. And I'm going to take care of my body. So it was not the most pleasant day. But it's also not the worst day. I use some of that energy to kind of motivate me to do some writing and to get some work done. 
when I feel that I want to be active. And so I was like, well, I'll lay down, do some breathing exercises. Then I'll get up and I'll get some stuff done because I'm feeling agitated. So I kind of turned that into getting some things done, but I didn't blame my wife for what happened, which is, that's new for me because in, in the past I would have blamed her for what was happening to me, which is kind of silly, but that's what we do. Yeah. It's, it's amazing how quickly we get upset over the, seems like the smallest things, but it's that whole iceberg. That's just the top of the iceberg and then and it under goes, the water it usually, is huge. It usually goes yeah. back to childhood because the intensity that I was feeling only makes sense in the context of me being a small person in the world. Like there's no way. Like for for her, you know, she was like maybe two out of ten upset, right? She didn't yell at me or anything. She was just a little upset. For that to trigger such an intense reaction in my body means that my mind is is approaching this from the position of a powerless child in the world because there's just no other reason to feel that intensity. So I don't know. You know, I can't trace this back to my child. I don't know exactly what's happening. Same time, I don't really need to know because it is happening. It's too late to stop it. And I'm just going to deal with what's real. Yeah. And it could have been something like just the, the anger turned inward. It's like, well, hey, I was in charge of this. I messed this up. Or how come so-and-so didn't do their job? How hard is it to put the right McMuffin in the bag. So now I'm dealing with somebody else's mistake and I've let my family down. We can go way off the deep end and in, over the smallest things. And it's all you know, what, what we're telling ourselves and not being in touch with our bodies. Uh, I know there's been times where I'll come home from work and my body's telling me, keep your mouth shut. Something's going on here. Not the time to have a deep conversation with the wife. Absolutely. And and I'll just tell her, like, hey, just give, give me a few minutes. I just need to kind of, something's going on. I got to figure it out. And we can talk afterwards. And it's usually something silly that I've been hanging on to from work or, or something else. But not really knowing what it is, but my body's telling me, mm -hmm. hey, something's not right. But you've developed that awareness to be aware of what's happening. Because, mm -hmm. you know, until we learn that skill to say, wait, what's going on in my body? So I have a similar rule to you where when I feel uh, anxious or te tension, I mean, the history between me and my wife is I, I'm a pretty anxious person. And most of that anxiety historically was about our marriage. And so my rule is I will never approach her. I mean, unless it's like urgent, but it, for, for some side, a kind of relationship concern, I will not approach her until I calm myself down. And so usually, you know, if I have some kind of concern come up, I'll write it down. I'll let it sit for 24 hours. And if it still matters after 24 hours, which is about half the time it does, then I'll say, okay, can I bring my best self to this conversation? That means I'm going to be an adult. I'm going to be calm. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to be upset because none of that helps. Like all of those feelings, those are for me to deal with. Those are not for my wife to deal with. She has her own stuff to deal with. I don't need to pile on my own, my stuff on top of hers. And so I'm going to bring my best self to conversation. She might get upset. That's okay. But I'm going to, I'm going to take care of my feelings. I'm going to take care of my half. Plus. Yeah. I love that, that exercise where you write it down. I'm going to check back with it in 24 hours because... Oh, there's so many times where but, it's like, man, about this half is the time I just read it and I just chuckle. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I was like, it seemed like a really big deal like yesterday. Yep. And if, if you would have gotten into that conversation the day before, it probably would have led to several other issues. It does not go well. We got a few minutes left and my last quick question for you, even though it's probably not going to be a quick answer, but that's okay. So I know for me, most men, if. My wife or girlfriend came to me, says, hey, we need to go to counseling. That automatically gets an emotional response because we as men, especially military first responders, we're like, oh, we, I got this. Hey, I'm in control of my relationships. I don't need somebody telling me da, 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 da. So what's the red flag? How does a couple know, hey, we need to see somebody such as yourself rather than try to tough it yeah. out? I would say, I mean, sooner is better. You know, the, the longer we spend in a relationship where, where you're just kind of like hurting each other every day or every week, you know, if, there's, if the relationship overall, if you're really enjoying being with each other, that's great. Uh, most relationships, honestly, aren't that way. So, you know, 40% of marriages end in divorce, and there's about another 40% that just really aren't enjoying each other's company. Unfortunately, marriage is really hard. It demands of us that we grow up to a, an extent that most of us, maybe our parents didn't grow up that much, or we didn't have that example, or we don't really know how to grow up that much. So that's when you, you kind of look for outside help. Reading books helps. I've gotten a lot of my understanding from books. But, but 
what you're looking for in a therapist is you're, you're looking for a therapist who has a happy marriage themselves, a therapist who's figured this out on their own. And so you do that first thing with a therapist. Tell me about your own marriage. Tell me about your own relationship. What has worked for you? And it's so hard. It's hard for marriage therapists to be married. I can be a professional and know all the things, come home, and when I'm with my wife, everything falls apart because this becomes about how mature a person am I capable of being. And I can only help someone to the extent that I have figured it out myself. That's what I'd recommend. But I would say go early, go often, and, and hunt around until you find the right therapist. You know, just because someone has the credentials doesn't mean that they're actually going to help. So I would look for an older, an older marriage therapist as opposed to a younger marriage therapist, someone who's actually figured out what it means to be married and what it means to actually love someone. That's not something we figure out in our 20s. So I would look for someone a bit older. And I... I think all couples should go to marriage therapy, at least a couple of sessions. And if you have any degree of strife in your marriage and you want happiness, definitely, definitely find someone to help you with that. Yeah, most definitely. Because, and that's, that's alarming. 40% divorced, 40% unhappy. So there's only 2% of us out there having happy marriages. It's incredibly rare. And if you think of your yeah. friends, I'm mean, thinking your 10 closest friends who are married, how many of them are really enjoying their marriage, like really enjoying, not tolerating, but actually enjoying their marriage. How many of them actually want to see each other? How much, how many enjoy being with each other? It's, mm -hmm. it, it's just a difficult thing to learn to do. And one of the reasons is we learned, like I said, we learned about human relationships as, as child parent dynamic where we have no power. I need you to like me so I can survive. Coming into marriage, you have to change that to the point where I'm okay. I'm not coming to you to make me okay. I'm bringing my best self to you because I want to love you. It's a very different dynamic. If you go into second marriages, it's even higher. Second marriage is 65% divorce and it goes up to a third and a fourth. So your chances of figuring out on second try, I mean, I'm not opposed to divorce, but it doesn't usually solve the problem. So the problem is usually internal. When we decide, oh, I'm going to try with someone else. There's this common idea in culture that I just didn't find the right person. And that idea is usually not, not correct. Yeah. It's definitely interesting. I was reading an article the other day where people are waiting longer to get married, waiting longer mm -hmm. to have children. And it's just my own personal bias. I'm thinking probably not a bad idea because <laughs> there are some, you know, there are some benefits. To yeah. That. Yeah. Cause I'm looking back on when, when I was in my twenties. Yeah. It was, that's, I, it would ended up in divorce. No, no doubt. But I was not uh, mature enough to handle uh, a wife and kids and all that. And, you see kids get married at 18 and stuff. It's like your brain's not fully developed. Late 20s, early 30s, there you go. But yeah, it, it's definitely interesting how you know, it's definitely shifted to get married early, have a bunch of kids, to focus on your career, get married later in life, have kids later in life. So I always find that interesting when I see those articles. It's like, is it good or is it bad? It's uh, it's a struggle. And I just think if we just, we take that, I mean, I wish our culture would tell us more from the beginning because we're like happily ever after. We're like, no, you just took the first step on the trail to Mount Everest. That's what you did. Congratulations on getting married. Have fun climbing the mountain. It's the most difficult thing you will ever do if you want to have an actual happy marriage where you enjoy being with each other. And let's, let's be frank. Like I have four children. The great prize in life. I'm going to cry if I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. The great prize in life is for me and my wife to welcome home our grandchildren and to still be in love with each other when that happens. That's the thing that so few people attain. So for my grandchildren to come back to my home and to have their grandmother standing next to me and for us to still be in love, that's a 10, 20% price. Most people don't get there. I ferociously want it. I say, now it's not all in my control. My wife gets her choices, but there's so much that I can do to be a better husband, to be a better father, to be a better person. And as long as I can find the things that I can change, the things that are in my power, continue chasing those goals, then I'm increasing the odds that I get to have that, that prize, which we underestimate how wonderful it is to be grandparents. Like that's, that's the thing that we all want. We just don't know. Yeah. And it's, unfortunately, we don't, we reach a certain age and we're just like, Hey, I'm done. This is the best that I can be. I don't. I don't make an effort to educate myself. I just, then I start struggling through life and 
I, I'm a firm believer. I don't care what your age is. You you can learn something new. You can better yourself through so just ed- education. Pick up a book. Stop watching the Kardashians. There's certain things that we can't even learn until we're in our 40s. There's just, you know, your first 20 years in life, you're physically growing, your body's developing. Your next 20 years, your brain is developing. And your last 20 years, your soul, not your last, you're also the past 60. But your next 20 years from 40 to 60, this is when you grow your soul. And there's just certain things that, you know, you're in your 20s, you know, I commend you for trying. There's certain parts of wisdom in life that are just not available to you until you have lived a certain number of decades on the earth. And so we do have this cultural idea that, oh, I'm 40 years old, I'm done growing. Well, no, you just started. Okay? And there's so many riches of wisdom and goodness and love and kindness and courage that are only accessible to people who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. So don't stop. Keep chasing those pearls. All right. Well, just to wrap things up here. So if you said that you've gotten a lot of wisdom from books. I'm a huge fan of self-help books. And if you've listened to this podcast, I've probably brought this book title up quite a bit, but I, I like it. It's a simple book, easy read. And I, I, most people have heard of it, but the, to me, The Four Agreements is an amazing self-help book. I highly recommend checking it out. But from you, marriage therapists, are there any good marriage And my favorite marriage book is Passionate Marriage by David Schnarch. It's a book about marriage and sexuality and specifically, and it addresses the reasons that sexuality falls apart in marriage, which happens to almost every couple. And then my other favorite book is not only about marriage, it's about life and marriage. It's called Already Free by Bruce Tift. And that one is about understanding why we feel these intense, unpleasant sensations in our chest that we feel. And what that's all about and how that relates to childhood and what can I do about it. So a lot of things that I was telling you about being kind to the sensations in your chest, that comes from Tift. He takes, he, his book is about kind of a therapeutic, a Western therapeutic approach to living a better life combined or compared to a Eastern Buddhist approach to living a better life. And it's the best explanation of both sides that I've ever encountered. Really a truly beautiful book. Both are the Schnarch book is not available as an audio book. There is an audio lecture that the summary of the book that's available on Audible, uh, but the actual book is not available in Audible format. The Tift book is available as an audio book, and he actually reads it himself. And it's, it's it doesn't read it so much as he delivers it as a lecture, and it's really beautiful. So I read. Oh yeah, I'll definitely have to check that out. The, there's thing. one more. There's one more typically relating to anger, which is the courage to be disliked by Kashimi. And that book is about how we use intense emotions to control other people. And it's incredibly insightful. If you want to understand why you feel certain things in certain places with certain people, the book will give you an answer that you won't find basically anywhere else. Yeah. And just from my own curiosity, has your wife ever said these words to you? Because my wife has. And because... We're fixers. We we try to find solutions. And I I remember early in our relationship, my wife was like, I already have a therapist and you're not them. Stop trying to be my therapist. I just need you to listen. I've heard that. I've heard that (laughs) once or twice. Okay. But yeah, I mean, it's, and that's, to me, that's probably one of the toughest things. And I'm just like, I've got wisdom. I've got solutions, but you know, she don't want to hear them from me. No, Um, it's. It's not appropriate in, in the context of a relationship because because it's a form of consent saying I understand this and you do. No, it, that's an interesting. That's been actually a challenge for me. Navigate that. There's I have a tendency to look down on people, especially my wife, and so that's been a challenge that I've been been wrestling with, learning to see her as an equal and not as someone that I should look down on. It's a personal yeah. personal challenge that I face. Yeah, so I know I wouldn't alone. I love talking about relationships. I've always tend to lean towards relationships, whether I'm doing alcohol and drug treatment, domestic violence, anger management, because relationships are just they're just part of the human experience, and it's a huge part of it. We are social creatures, and if our relationships are not making us happy, then we're going to find other ways to try to feel happy and to try to get our way, and it usually never turns out the way we want it. Well, it's better for you. All right. And thank you so much for being on. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Do you have any social media sites, websites, any books that you need to pitch? Or- yeah, my, I, I don't have a book. My, my website is jason.com. I offer telehealth therapy throughout California, so you can sign up if you, if you want to 
especially I do individuals, mostly couples, but also individuals. I do trauma therapy, EMDR, and work with a lot of first responders, a lot of veterans, do men's work, but especially marriage. If you want help with your marriage with sexuality, that's my that's my main endeavor. So kind of what drives me is to help people have better marriages. All right. So if you're in California and want to try to better your marriage, please uh, reach out to James. And I think I'll wrap it up right there. All right. Well, that was our interview with the James Christensen. I thoroughly enjoyed that interview. A lot of good tips, a lot of good knowledge. We really undervalue the impact relationships play in our day-to-day lives. If you're out there and you're struggling, don't be afraid. Don't be too macho to sit down and talk with somebody. I think marriage counseling is uh, a good thing. I highly recommend it because relationships, like I just said, it plays such a huge role in our lives. And if we're not happy in our relationships, we're not going to be happy in life. You know, the old, the old saying, happy wife, happy life, you know, but they want you to be happy too. So it's got to be a mutual relationship there, mutual happiness. So if you're in California and you're seeking out some assistance, you know, he says he does it telehealth, virtual. I highly recommend uh, checking out Mr. Christensen. There was a little hiccup in the audio when he gave out his website. So I'm going to give it to you here. It's James, J-M-E-S, M, the letter M, Christensen, C-H-R-I-S-T-E-N-S-E-N.com. And if you didn't get that and you want it, just email me and I'll gladly point you in his direction. Especially if you're a veteran, active military, first responder, I think he's probably the go-to guy. He's been there, he's done it, and he seems to have a good thing going. All right, just uh, basic stuff here. Um, Check us out on our social media stuff. I'm not good at posting stuff on there. I'm trying to get better at it. But if you're on uh, X or Twitter, it's anger underscore LLC. And for YouTube and Instagram, it's the same one. It's at Freedom From Anger LLC. I do have the the subscription thing up on uh, Spotify. I'm still not 100% sure how I want to go about doing that. If you have any suggestions, please let me know. I would love to have kind of a a Q&A thing on there. Post videos of questions that people send me or I'd probably have more luck just video of me playing with my dogs. <laughs> I'd probably get get more reaction. I find it very interesting if I post a video or a podcast on YouTube. I'll, I'll get a few a few hits, and then I'll post a video of my dogs, and they'll get thousands. But I don't know. Maybe that's just the world we live in. So, yeah, if you have any ideas about getting it started or what do you want to see, I want you to get your dollar's worth, literally a dollar. But I might just start start posting stuff on there and see what happens. Please check out our website, freedomanger.com. Check out all of our courses or classes that we have on there. If you're interested, please let me know. If you need any recommendations, if you're looking for a self-help book or something doing for relationships, anger, whatever, I have a boatload of stuff. I'll gladly send you for free. All you got to do is email me. I'm here to help start this podcast, trying to help people. I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. You can either find the information on our website, freedomanger.com, or you can email me directly, james, J-E-M-E-S, at freedomanger.com. Okay, I think that's enough plugging, and I'll let y'all go about your day. And as always, stay safe. Mm-hmm.